All right, so today we're gonna piss some people off. We're gonna run stringers on this plate right here. We're gonna run some weaves on here using some Select Arc 730 gas shielded flux core. Once we get done with these plates, we're gonna take them up to Troy, Ohio and let some smart guy in a lab coat test these out with uh, tensile pulls and Sharpie V-notch. So we're gonna run the same exact settings. The only thing we're gonna change is technique and we're gonna kinda show you guys the difference between the two. So let's get started. So basically what I'm going to do is both of these plates have a half inch root opening. So I'm going to run a little bit wider of a stringer in both of these. You can call it a weave or a wide stringer, whatever you want to call it. It's about a half inch width. Um, so we're going to do the, the same root on each piece and then that's when we're going to start going into different techniques. I'll probably run two stringers in here and then a weave for my, uh, my hot pass right after that uh, root goes in. And then we'll just keep building up from there until we're, until we're capped off. All right, so we got the root in on both sides. We're gonna go ahead, we're gonna try to keep both plates under 350 interpass temperature uh, between welding on them just to keep it fair. We're gonna be keeping, uh, keeping track using a 350 degree temple stick. Um, I'm gonna go ahead, clean this one up, and then I'll go ahead and throw two stringers in here. And then after that, I'll go ahead and, and throw a, a weave pass in here. All right, pass number two on the weave side. Less than 350. All right, <clears throat> more stringers. All right, <clears throat> she's less than 350. I'll go ahead and put another pass in there. That's borderline. Throw another pass in over here while I'm waiting.
All right, guys, so uh, both these plates are exceeding 350 degrees, which is kind of, we can't exceed that, but we're trying to keep this as a baseline. So we're gonna keep both plates under 350 degrees inner pass temperature. So we're gonna go ahead and take a, take a quick break, let this stuff cool down, uh, and then we'll get back to it. One thing I do wanna mention, uh, this weld right here, and I anticipate this one's gonna do it as well. This side over here on my left, your right, is a little bit lower than the side on the right, my right hand side. Uh, your left as you're looking at it at home. What I can do to fix this is rotate the plate or weld with my non-dominant hand. So right now I'm welding uh, left to right. I could switch over and go from right to left. That's probably what I'm gonna end up and do. That's gonna give me a lower end here and it's gonna give me, allow me to get a little bit more build up in here. It's, it's common if I was out in a shop environment or something, I'd probably just stand on the other side of the table if I couldn't flip the weldment around. Um, it's, it's just good to learn how to weld with both hands. So I'll probably go ahead and maybe weld this out left-handed, um, you know, just to guys show you guys a little bit of versatility and, and be able to take care of these little discontinuities. Well, not really discontinuities, but um, slight imperfections. So we'll go ahead and do that when we come back. Five minutes later. All right, so we're below 350 on each plate. We go ahead and uh, keep running passes. Ideally, I want to get to where I'm about 1 16th of an inch below the surface of the material. That's just my preference. Uh, that's what I've always taught in the past. So about a 16th below, and then I'll go ahead and shoot for that cap. That way I don't exceed that eighth inch allow allowable weld reinforcement on either one of these plates. So we're going to try and keep it, uh, keep it to specs here. All right, and away we go. left-handed a little low on this side All right, so note to self, uh, if you change hands, change gloves. It's a little warm on the back side of the right hand. We'll get through it. All right, this one's ready. I'm probably gonna put about two passes in here, maybe three. Try to get caught up with this weave. The weave is uh, a lot faster. I'm ready to go to cap on that side. I think I got it. Build this uh this one layer in and then probably one more and I'll be ready to go to cap over here. So so far we've definitely faster, but uh, that's not what we're here to test, so that cool a little bit and uh, I'm gonna go ahead and cap this. Alright so camera guy thinks I should cap this in one pass. I typically like to go on uh, something this thick about 3 16 outside the, uh, the edge, the top edge of these plates and tie into the base metal about 3 16 on that one side so that'll give me a a, a final cap pass of about an inch and three eighths because I have one inch spacing in between here. Um, never ran a weave that that wide, so we'll see how it turns out. All right, she's capped. Go ahead and finish up the uh, stringer side. All 
try to let that cool down for a couple minutes and then uh, gonna throw another couple passes in there and we'll be ready to cap. This side's already ready. Uh, I got a little low over here. I'm gonna go ahead and get that filled in and then we'll be ready to ready to cap it. All right, so we are ready to go to cap on our stringer piece. Uh, I'm probably gonna run three bead cap on here, I think. It's a little bit wider uh, of a weld, so I, th I think uh, we'll be able to cap her in three. So, oh geez, folks, it's showtime. All right, guys, so that's it. We got stringers, we got a weave. We're gonna go ahead, pack this stuff up, head on to the airport, get up to Troy, Ohio, see the guy up there in the lab coat. We're gonna do some tensile pulls and some Sharpie V-notch and see which results are better between the two. Hopefully we can put this, uh, this argument to bed once and for all, so let's, let's head out. All right, guys, so we're inside the Select Arc facility inside their lab. I've got uh, Ben Cahoot with me. Ben, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself to the viewers. Ben Cahoot, I've uh, been at Select Arc for four years now. Um, in charge of the laboratory here. So basically what we have is uh, we ran some samples down in Florida. We've got one push, or I'm sorry, one stringer and one weave sample. And basically what we're planning on doing is we're gonna get some tensile bar specimens out of here. So we'll do a tensile test on it. And then a couple of Sharpie V-notch and kind of show the, the viewers how you guys go through and test weld metal. And um, I think by the end, we should have some, some significant results as far as the, uh, the strength and uh, impact resistance of the, the two techniques of welding. All right, so Ben, why don't you explain to the viewers uh, how we get from point A to point B as far as getting the samples prepped and, and ready to, for, for testing. Yep, so uh, basic conformance testing for AWS requires, for these type wires, this was welded with the 730, correct? Yep, yep, so it's a 71 T1 and a T9. So basically we need to get two sets of Sharpies out of it. One tested at minus 20 um, Fahrenheit and one at zero degrees Fahrenheit. Basically all we need to do is get a, a tensile out of here. We're gonna water jet that out. So it's a standard size for us. So we, it's a standard blank size for us. We can throw it in the lathe, machine it down, and get a 505 round specimen out of it. That's where we'll do the tensile testing behind us. And then uh, we'll also get two sets of five CVNs out of it. Um, that is actually if we had a 14 inch plate. We have a 12 inch plate, so right. we're, we're basically just gonna probably test the zero F or maybe the minus 20 F. But, um, Standard is a, a group of five, drop the high and the low. We'll again throw that on the uh, water jet, flake out five specimens, and go from there. Okay. And then can you guys pull a, a section out here so we can kind of do a metal graphic sketch on there too and kind of see the grain structure yes, sir. between the two techniques? Yep. We'll put a blank out there, we'll polish it up, uh, do a quick etch on it, and then it'll show you the past layer sequence and the, just the general macro structure of that. So. Awesome. Well, hopefully, guys, we can put this myth to bed as to which is better, stringer versus weave. Uh, so we'll go ahead and get this started and kind of show you the different steps involved. All right, so we got the samples ready. I noticed you, uh, you're punching, you're putting two punch points on there. You want to go kind of explain that? Yeah, so to, in order to uh, measure the elongation, pretty much you have a set of two inch uh, punches right here. I put in three sets of punches uh, only because my, my first set is the center set. Um, we put a taper into the specimen already, so we should influence the sample to break right in the center. Okay. But if there is a slight chance that it, it breaks off center, I'll be able to effectively capture the best elongation. Um, so that's why I kind of offset the last two punches. And for those that don't know, that just, that's just how much it's gonna stretch yep. the original sample until the end piece. Yep. Yes, so sir, what we're testing now is we're gonna test the, or the um, ultimate tensile strength of each, each of these specimens. Yep, From, for a tensile test, you can get three key things out of it um, normally what you get out of it is the elongation. Um, that's what we just discussed, but also, yeah, the ultimate tensile strength and the yield strength of the material. And the yield strength, that's just where you... The yield strength is yeah, plastic. where it's elastic and where it turns into a plastic deformation, where it will never return to its original shape. Now we have the extensometer, which is a strain, strain gauge, um, which will, actual, will measure the actual stretching of the part. You can measure the actual stretching of the, of, the, of the machine from the machine, but the strain gauge will capture the actual sample itself, so it's a more accurate uh, source of measurement. 
starting the test. Right now, all the test is going to do, it's going to load it up at a slow rate um, just to get something going on the graph. It's going to detect it and then auto balance. And now everything should, should go as, as planned. Uh, this right here is the linear elastic portion of the curve. Um, from this, this uh, I guess, slope, you can get the Young's modules out of it as well. Um, but yeah, right now, theoretically, I could stop the test and return the sample uh, back to you know zero, and the sample return back to its original shape, just like it was when you stuck it in there. Yep. Okay. But once it hits that point of plasticity, it starts to deform. That's where it'll never go back to its original state. Right. Okay. Yep. And it's hard to capture exactly when that that's happening, um, where it's getting off that straight portion of the curve. So uh, what what they do is, is they they basically go 0.2 percent off of that straight portion of the curve, which is the line that will be drawn on the graph, and that's the actual yield strength that will be captured. Okay. So, so basically, uh, to get the actual uh, stress measurement out of here, the ultimate tensile stress, uh, st tensile strength is the same, the same thing, it's load over area. So basically, I told the machine the diameter of the sample, it knows it's a round sample, and it can calculate the area. Which is where you, when you measure with the dial calipers? Yep. Okay. Yep. And so I tell it the, the diameter, it knows the area, and then it'll, you know, it knows the load, obviously, with the load cell into it. Um, and it will give us that, that tensile strength calculation. And because we use like a 70,000 series electrode, what we should see is that, that specimen should be at least 70,000 pounds of tensile strength. Yep. yep. Now, do you think being a stringer or being a weave, do you think that's going to have a significant impact? And the tensile? Um, with the with the wide weave and the, uh, the significant heat that you put into it, you may soften it up a bit, um, and so you might get deteriorated tensile strength. Um, that that's pretty much it. You'll you'll probably see a little bit higher with the with the stringers. Okay. I think the uh, tensile strength is less influenced by your your heat input than the CVNs. I think you'll see more of a dramatic change. Um, in the, in the, the Sharpies? Sharpie okay. Sharpies, yeah. So right now it, it, it yielded. Um, it hasn't drawn the 0.2% the offset yet, but it will. Eventually it's going to tell me to take off the extensometer. Uh, this sample will break eventually, and so it doesn't want to break with the extensometer onto it. Obviously they're expensive pieces. Yeah, I imagine it's pretty pricey. you got to get it calibrated after that or just replace it outright. Yep. Right now uh, you go a certain strain rate. So we controlled the, the rate through the yield based, based on the ASTM E8 method, um, the strain rate. It, it, you can control it three ways. We control it by the strain rate. But uh, basically, it's a slower, slower pull. And then after you get captured that yield point, the test is going to speed up after that. OK. And it should start to bottleneck right around the area where it's going to deform, right? Yep. Yep. You should get oh, that. There it goes right now. That's, this is a ductile material, so you should get that hourglass typical tensile look. I think it's going to break more towards the top. Yep. A little bit. All right, so basically now we have to measure this to compare the, uh, what we have now is compared to the sample that we had originally, right? Yep, so we're measuring the percentage elongation. We're seeing how far it's stretched. So uh, you go from those two points you originally punched, find out the difference between those. Yep and we'll, we will just line them up um, and then I'll put the caliper ends in there. Uh, it'll basically enter, it, enter that into the machine because the machine already knows, hey, you have, a, you have two inches punches to start. What's your final, your final length? Okay. And uh, it takes that percentage. And then you have to check the diameter too for the cross section? Yep, for reduction of area, some people want to know the, the, how much, how far, when it did stretch, when it, when it necked down, they want to know that neck how diameter. How far it went, okay. Yep. So I took those two measurements from the calipers <laughs> Uh, plug them into the computer. It did the math for me. Right here highlighted we have the elongation after fracture and a percentage. That's 26% elongation. It's pretty good. It's a ductile material. And then we have reduction of area. Um, that's 60, 68%, which is pretty representative of the uh, weld metal type we have, the 71T1 type wire. With the 730 wire, we have the results here. Um, it, it got a 90.5 KSI tensile strength and a 82 um, KSI yield strength. 
Uh, this being a 71T1 type wire, the minimum tensile strength requirement for the, for the specification is a 70 KSI tensile strength, so we're well above. Um, I think there is a max on that limit, so I think it's 95 KSI. Again, we're, we're within that range. So we're within, within the limits. We're right, right about where we need to be. I mean, it's pretty typical to what you see on a regular basis. Yeah, so with the, the 71T1s and most people's uh, 71T1 wire, uh, when you weld it in mixed gas, uh, 7525, you will retain a little bit more of that alloying. Um, this being a dual gas wire, it's going to mm. be on the higher side uh, just to meet, meet the tensile uh, strength requirements when you weld it in CO2 because you're going to burn some of that out. So right. we weld it in mixed gas. It is a little bit higher. It's a 90, 90 and a half KSI, but that's, that's you know, five KSI, on, KSI under the maximum. That's well within the limits. All right, let's go ahead and run the weave, see if we get anything different. Yeah, so right now it's starting to bottleneck and it's fixing to break. That didn't have near a violent reaction that uh, it typically does. Yeah, I think there might have been a slag inclusion or something that forced it to break prematurely. Um, already we can tell that the yield strength is lower. Don't mind the ultimate tensile strength if they haven't calculated the, uh, hasn't calculated that yet, but uh, the results are different for this weave. Oh, shows that there's still a load on here. Wow. All right, so what's the, uh, what did we come up as far as the difference between stringer versus a weave? Yeah, so this was the weave sample, and from the results, it appears that the tensile strength is about, this was 84 KSI, so what's the difference there? 6,000 um, KSI, the yield strength here is 69.5. Uh, that's, that's pretty significant difference, I don't know, what, I forget what the last one was, it's like a 15 KSI difference, that's pretty significant. Um, and there's probably a reason for that, and it goes along with this elongation. There wasn't, it didn't elongate as much as the other sample did. It's 24%, and the reduction of area didn't get there either. Uh, the reason probably for all this to, to be a little bit lower is the, the heat input, uh, number one, for the tensile strength, but for the yield elongation and reduction of area, uh, it appears that there was something, maybe a uh, porosity or some sort of, uh, I don't know, anomaly in the in the center of the of the sample, so that probably led to a premature fracture. If it was trap slag, I think you would you probably see a, in there. a darker. Um, this this being a light kind of circle, um, it could be two things. It could be the, the porosity in there, um, where you just had a gas bubble just freeze in there, or or a hydrogen being trapped in there. Okay. So now we saw the differences between the weave and the stringer. Let's go over and do the CVN and see right. see the difference. We should there. see a significant difference in that also, right? I think so. Yeah. All right. All right, so we got a Sharpie v notch samples. Um, what do we have to do to them before we put them in the instrument? So there are a lot of requirements. This is a very specific test, very tight tolerances on everything with the sample. Um, basically, you have to measure the length. There's a length requirement. It doesn't want to be too long to pass through the anvils. Um, you have a thickness and you have a width re requirement on them. Um, and then you also have very specific uh, requirements on all, all the critical measurements. The critical measurements to me on this test are the ligament length, so the area behind the bottom of this notch. That's what's actually going to be felt when, or I guess, absorbing the energy. So that right there is a very tight tolerance. Also, you have the angle of the notch. That's uh, 45 degrees plus or minus one degree. And then you have the radius of the notch. Um, obviously, if you have it more obtuse, um, it would be less easy to break, and if it was a, a tighter radius, then it would probably influence the break easier. So um, very tight um, window on all of these. So basically, we, we measure one sample out of the set because mm -hmm. they're all machined at the same time, and we, we uh, then enter that in the computer, keep those critical measurements, and go from there. So for those that don't know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to get put in this machine behind us with the, the V-notch facing away from the force, right? Yes. So this little notch is going to face away from the force. He's got a hammer on the inside that's going to come down and smack this, and it's going to measure the foot-pounds it took to actually break this. Um, so like you said, it's very specific. Typically what they do, I think you've mentioned it before, is they take the, they're going to do five samples of each. They're going to take the high sample and the low sample and drop those and then average the three middle ones. Is that right? Yep. 
Um, so we'll go ahead, these have to sit in a uh, uh, bath of methanol. Yeah, so this is a 71T1 type wire. Um, this one actually conforms to a, a T9 as well, but we are just testing the T1 capability of this, meaning we're gonna test it at zero degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. If we're testing at the, for the T9, that'd be minus 20 Fahrenheit. But yeah, we're gonna throw it in the bath. It basically, we basically just have a, a chiller and it has methanol in it. It's just gonna, you, you hold it at that temperature for a minimum of five minutes per the spec, and then you have five seconds to get out of the bath and to test. It's a, it's a pretty quick turnaround time. You think you'll be able to pull it off? Absolutely not. I'm sure you'll have to cut, <laughs> you, know, you know, do a couple cuts and edits and all that stuff. So it'll be all right. Pressure's on, it'll be fine. All right, let's get it. Yep. Five minutes later. All right, so we've hit our five minute mark. We're go ahead and we're ready to start testing now. Do you want to do the stringers first? Or you want to do the weaves? Let's do the stringers. Same, right. same order as the tensile. Okay. All right, so we tested all five samples here. Um, there was some scatter in the results. You have an average of 43 foot-pounds, 43 and a half. Uh, you drop the high and the low, you would probably be around 37-ish. So um, it's passing uh, AWS conformance testing. It's 20 foot-pound minimum at zero degrees, so uh, sample conforms. Awesome. So let's go ahead and test the, uh, test the weaves. Yep. Already one below the requirements. All right, so wow, that was uh, pretty significant. I mean, I. Not sure what all the numbers mean, but I know at least two of the specimens didn't meet the, the minimum so here, requirements, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, more than that. So, uh, one, three, three out of the five didn't meet. One rounded up, kind of, to to meet the 20 foot pound minimum. Uh, so yeah, it wasn't as good. So this is showing definitely that the higher heat input, the big wide weaves, uh, really matters on your in your toughness values. When right. You, when you do the test. So, I mean, I know that the, the cap that we put on there was a bit excessive. I mean, I have seen people do that before. We just kind of wanted to show the difference between stringers and weaves, but this wasn't pulled off the surface of the weld. This is actually a little bit in the inside of the, of the meat in the center yeah. of the weld. And I mean, that's all weld metal sample. So like you were saying earlier, that it gives you a much more complex grain structure with that additional heat input versus running the stringers and kind of let them cool in between passes and things. Yeah, when you have a, a high heat into it and you don't split your beads, basically you have these large columnar grains and you have a lot of grain, grain boundary ferrite, probably has some other stuff going on as well. Um, recipe for disaster and Sharpie testing for sure. Okay. Well guys, so there you have it. Uh, stringers beat weaves in both of the tests, both the tensile pole as well as the Sharpie V-notch. So we want to appreciate you guys watching. I uh, hope you guys learned something. hope you can take something away from this. Uh, it's probably not the end all be all to stringers versus weaves, but it's a pretty good start. Uh, ben, thanks for having us out, man. No I really problem. appreciate it. Guys, make sure you like and subscribe to the video. If you learned something, hit that notification bell at the bottom. Um, that way you get notified every time we release a video on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, 5.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And until next time, make every well better than your last.